George S. Jones currently serves as president of WAEN-TV here in Atlanta, Georgia. Mr. Jones has been developing television networks for others for over 15 years. This has afforded him experience in every area of television networking. Fueled by his aspirations to contribute to community development and to assist with the growth of small businesses, he later came up with the idea to develop a worldwide television network that would impact local communities. Thus, WAEN-TV was born. Mr. Jones' educational achievements have aided him tremendously in his role as leader of this organization. In 1975, he received his Bachelor of Arts in Mass Communication from Francis Marion College while concurrently earning an associate degree as an electrician from Williamsburg Technical College. Mr. Jones has produced several special functions for many community churches and nonprofit organizations. One of his most recent successes was the production of the first 100 Black Men of Atlanta banquet where his work was greatly applauded. George also displays his versatility with the production of music videos. Included in his resume, you will find a number of successful music artists, including former So So Deaf recording artist Chris Kelly of the famed hip hop duo Chris Cross. TSA. The interesting thing about Otha is that he has a military background, he has his own business, he does consulting, and he's passionate about education. I'm going to start off now, Otha, and I'm going to um, let you tell my guests a little bit about yourself. Okay, Rita, first of all, thank you for having me here on the show this evening. And um, I'm from Elberton, Georgia. Um, uh, Born and pretty much raised here. I lived in Augusta, Savannah for a while. So I went through public schools throughout my uh, career here in Georgia. Okay, <laughs> there we go. So uh, I'm from Elberton, Georgia, originally up in Northeast Georgia. Uh, I've lived in Augusta, Savannah, Georgia. Uh, basically public schools throughout my life and then I went to Morehouse in 85 to 89 okay. uh, graduated Same from here. yeah graduated from Morehouse and went on uh, into the military okay. and uh, the reason I went in the military was like a family tradition you know mm -hmm. we we have uh, records of my family being in the military since the 1700s um, so uh, it was just a family tradition. I'm oldest of seven. Okay. And uh, of the seven, five boys, four of us are military and combat veterans. Oh, wow. And uh, at one time, actually, we were all, uh, two of us were in Iraq together and one was in Afghanistan. Okay. So we, uh, again, just a strong military tradition. Mm -hmm. uh, went into the military and, uh, like I say, served, been 25 countries in the world. Mm -hmm. 
uh, traveling and uh, visiting, and my wife is an educator. Okay. Spelman class of eighty nine. Right, also. Okay, that's right. <laughs> so we ended up uh, again her being an educator mm -hmm. and me working closely with my kids. Mm -hmm. My son graduated from Morehouse. Mm -hmm. My daughter attended Spelman. So we are very involved okay. in education throughout their lives. Okay. And as far as education is concerned, uh, when we moved from Germany hmm. in uh, nineteen. Uh, correction 2005 we um, journey to Maryland I went to my uh, kids first PTA meeting uh, my wife was assigned to another high school so when I showed up to the PTA meeting there were seven parents there mm -hmm. and the problem with that was there were 2,000 kids in the school so the post commander at Fort Meade we were going through a base realignment mm -hmm. at that time and we we're going to get 20,000 more uh, people five years later mm -hmm. So uh, when the PTA president said, well, we don't have enough parents uh, for officers like, you know, this year, so we still need uh, parents. So the mm -hmm. post commander looked at me and said, uh, Thornton, what are we going to do about this? Okay. And I said, hey, uh, sir, I just arrived in the country about a month ago. He said, what are we going to do about this? So I, I tell people I was voluntold. I became the uh, vice president of the high school PTA, and that's okay. sort of what really got and me. And so that's how you guys started. Okay, let's, let's go back to Elberton, and I sure. want to work my way up to that sure. um, point in your life. I did a little bit of research about Elberton, Georgia. It seems like a very small town. I think it's called the uh, granite capital of the world. That is correct. What was it like growing up there? Well, it's uh, in the part of the Appalachian zone, mm -hmm. and like say, uh, my family, like my grandfather, they worked in the rock industry, mm -hmm. basically. Okay. Uh, a good community to, to grow up in. Mm -hmm. um, I moved from there at about five years old, moved mm -hmm. to Savannah, Georgia. Okay. My father attended Savannah State. Okay. okay. So I lived there for about three, you know, about three years or so. Okay. Then we moved from Savannah to Augusta for eight. Oh, wow. And then the last part of my middle school years, about the end of seventh grade, we moved back to Elberton. Okay. So I went through uh, uh, high school, middle school and high school okay. there in Elberton. Okay. But it was a good place to, you know, raise a family. So you've pretty much lived throughout different parts of Georgia. Yes, I have. And as an adult, I lived in Columbus. Okay. Uh, I was stationed there for about a year and a half, and then I worked up at a Boy Scout camp in the northwest corner of the <laughs> wow. state. So every corner of Georgia. <laughs> so you were in Atlanta, of course, for four years. Yes. While yes. you were at Morehouse. That's correct. Okay. Um, who was your favorite teacher? I would say um, in high school it was uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Thiel. Mm -hmm. He was my social studies teacher, uh, which is my studies. favorite subject. Mine too. I yeah. teach social studies. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> One of the things that, that he did uh, in school was he, he just put a lot of emphasis on critical thinking. Uh -huh. So every day we would start off classes with, well, well you know, what were the events uh -huh. of the day? Uh, and, and he would make you really dig in, and he just would not take pat answers right. and using the Socratic method. So uh -huh. it was really, uh, he, he really stands out. And then... Uh -huh. Uh, my eighth grade teacher, Miss mm -hmm. Thornton, it, not not Ken. Okay, okay. But what she did for a group of us, uh, she would say, "You're a leader," and you know. So I expect, you know, you know, you know, better and, and the mm -hmm. best as you of leaders. Mm -hmm. So that really stood out. Okay. When she did, as she probably did with all the kids, okay. but but it really made people strive to really do great things. Okay. Expectations. Okay. Um, Morehouse College. What mm -hmm. made you choose Morehouse? Uh, my junior year in, in Elberton, I was looking at West Point. Oh. I was looking at Georgia Military Academy, mm -hmm. and um, so I lined up my visits that year. And Morehouse was my first visit. But my concern was I said I want to go to a school where leaders are built. And when I went there, got the tamp uh, campus tour. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther King, Maynard Jackson. I was like, "This is it. <laughs> this is where right, I'm supposed right. to be." So I ended up. Uh, um, uh, I said, "That was it. I applied on the spot. I got accepted early admission." <laughs> is that the only school you applied to when you did apply? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did it. the same thing with I Spelman. <laughs> I only applied to Spelman College, uh -huh. and I sometimes tease my students and I tell them. Had I not been accepted to Spelman, I probably would have worked for the post office. I would have been making a lot more money. 
Okay, well, when you were at Morehouse, um, what was your major? Uh, it, it was urban studies okay. with a concentration in planning. Okay. Uh, what I wanted to do, I wanted to be a city planner. My goal was to um, graduate from Morehouse, then go to the military for four years, and come back and be a city planner. In Elverton? No, Atlanta. <laughs> I okay. fell in love with Atlanta when I came here. I, I'm saying that because Elberton seems like it may need a little, but I haven't visited, so yeah. people of Elberton, don't yeah. judge me. I haven't been there. Okay, now, after leaving Morehouse, you got a master's degree in rhetoric and scientific technical communication, communication, technical yeah. communication. Mm -hmm. Could you explain that? Sure. Uh, what is it and what type of work do you do with that type of degree? Okay, well, um, um, I was at an engineering school, so I assessed, you know, what are what are my skill sets. Mm -hmm. So communications, I took a couple of courses in the, at the graduate school. Mm -hmm. I say I, I like this. You know, communications are very important. Yes. So I, I actually the the college um, had me being a communications professor, mm -hmm. and I, when I would talk to the engineers or I teach the engineers, I would say, okay, you could be the best engineer in the mm -hmm. world. But if you can't communicate your ideas, right. it, will, it will go nowhere. Right, right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in, you know, at Michigan Tech, I taught like interpersonal, cultural communication courses okay. to students, you know, across the campus, and okay. it was uh, a great experience. Okay, so you have taught before? Yes, I have. Okay, yes, I have. okay. Yes, I have. So, um, Michigan Tech, mm -hmm. they're the ones who bestowed upon you the doctorate degree, correct? The underwear doctorate degree? That is correct. Okay, when was that? That was 2009. Oh, wow. And it was just beca uh, because of um, um, achievement okay. uh, up to that point. Um, I had actually uh, finished my PhD coursework. Okay. Uh, and I And I was uh, put on orders to deploy to, you know, overseas oh, wow. uh, like my last year. And so I ended up leaving, okay. and uh, they remembered that, and I came back a couple of times, and just because of the achievements, mm -hmm. um, nationally and internationally, they awarded me the Ph.D. Okay. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. How long did you serve in the military, and what branch, and okay. how far did you go in the military okay. in terms of rank? Uh, 21 years. Wow. Um, I... Um, uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel, which okay. is considered wow. a successful career, yes. and uh, had some great assignments. I think I had to dream assignments. As a matter of fact, uh, my first assignment after training was uh, uh, Schofield Barracks, Hawaii. Okay. So I always joke with my wife and say, you know, that was your four-year honeymoon. <laughs> so we did four years in Hawaii. Okay. My son, Trey, who's a Morehouse okay. man, graduated, right. uh, uh, was born in Hawaii. Oh, okay. And uh, after I left there, uh, well, I, you know, I was ready to get out, and uh, they said, well, first I had a wine. It was like, uh, so uh, where would you like to go next? I said, oh, I have a say in the matter. It's like, sure. And, and, and my wife and I, we were debating. I could have went to anywhere in the world. She said, I want to go back to Georgia. So <laughs> she won that battle. So we, we came back to Fort Stewart, Georgia, okay. uh, South Georgia, where, you know, we we're, you know, close to home. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I just had a lot of great choices throughout mm -hmm. my career. And I ended my career mm -hmm. uh, in the White House. Uh, I, I received a call in uh, 2007 okay. uh, to come down to the Army uh, Human Resource Headquarters, and they called me down and they said, hey, we, we're looking at nominating you for uh, a White House uh, position, which you'd be interested. Oh, wow. So I went through that selection process where they you know, checked out your background. I had strong uh, manner of performance throughout my military career, mm -hmm. and I worked there from uh, uh, 2007 through 10. Wow. Mm -hmm. Impressive. Yeah. So yeah. then you were there um, pretty much during the term of President Obama. That is correct. I, um, I, I had a little short break. I did in a, a short Iraq tour okay. in there, but uh, I actually, and I tell people a story, the importance of education mm -hmm. and, uh, and the opportunities, mm -hmm. critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, when I was uh, interviewed and once I was hired, uh, President Bush's communications commander called me in and said, congratulations, you had the job. And he said, um, you know why we hired you? I said, uh, oh, why, sir? He said, well, uh, you think quick on your feet, and that's what we need for people working around the president. Mm. And he said, um, he said, 
when the new president comes on. That time we didn't, you know, President right. Obama, Senator Obama had right. announced. Exactly. He said we're going to have a whole new communication mm -hmm. suite, mm -hmm. and and one of your primary responsibilities will be to hire. Uh, I'm to help us hire okay. and man the White House Communications Agency. And I said, okay, sir, I got it, I understand. And he said, and the technology is still on the table. And I said, I'm ready to get fired now. <laughs> but, but anyway, but, but again, the, the education you know, piece kicked in, mm -hmm. you know, critical thinking. And I right. said, okay, I need to find the technical experts. Mm -hmm. And because working in the military, now the White House environment is almost civilian. Like, although we're military, mm -hmm. we wore... Uh, suits. Um, so I pulled together a, a, a team and we talked about the technology and what was there and we talked about what type of people we needed and I had to target areas say we need to go to the Special Operations mm -hmm. Command to get people to you know work mm -hmm. with this type mm -hmm. of equipment. So by the time President Obama came it was a smooth transition mm -hmm. of personnel and technology. Oh, okay. So that's one of the things with, with our kids today or our, you know, our young folks uh, just giving them an education where mm -hmm. they can, you know, be flexible mm -hmm. and critically think and make mm -hmm. things happen in, 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 the, in the world that we're in. And that's important. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you do now in your day-to-day -day, um, okay. employment? Are you, are you self-employed? Self <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you self-employed or do you hire yourself out through another company? Do yeah. you do consult it's consulting work or well, pr what? primarily right now at this I, I do contract work for oh, wow. for okay. uh, for uh, General Dynamics. Okay. I I work at a battlefield simulation center. So oh, wow. what, what we basically do is units as they're going to different places in the world. We uh, they come in the leaders and we program scenarios for them and they you know fight the scenarios and then they deploy. Oh wow, that's so, interesting. Yeah. So in my okay. particular, uh, I was an a intelligence officer most of my career mm -hmm. in the military. Okay. So that's my um, area of expertise. Okay. So I do a lot of advising in that area okay. uh, for the military. All right. Um, I want to go back now to your um, time with the PTA. I know you started off by talking about um, what it is that you did or how you got involved in sure. the PTA. I would like to know how you made it from being told uh -huh. that you're going to be <laughs> the vice president of the PTA and then end up um, becoming the first black national president of the PTA. The first male. Uh, Lois male. Jean White was the first back oh. in the late 97 and 99. Okay. I was the first African-American male. Okay. But, but no problem. No, basically what we did, um, so so I, I mean, with schools, I'm a solution-based person and being military, a military-based mm -hmm. person. No, what, are, what, are the, what is the answer to mm -hmm. the problem? So you talk to people, you gather information, you look at different things, and you come to a decision. Mm -hmm. But there's a model for, for schools that we use. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you want to make sure that schools are welcoming to families. That's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two, you want to make sure that you're communicating effectively with stakeholders in the school. Mm -hmm. You know, third, you want to make sure that you're supporting um, student success. Okay. And, you know, and you want to make sure that you're supporting every student, right. not just groups. Right. You want to make sure that you're doing power sharing. And then you want to make sure that you're engaging the community. Mm -hmm. So with that underpinning model, that was the you know the approach we took mm -hmm. to the school that mm -hmm. was a vice president. So okay. the first year, because we used those techniques, uh, we were able to move from 20 members to 200 members. Oh wow! And we had a good relationship with the principal. One of the um, uh, positions in PTA is that you support the principal and the school leadership. Right. Right. So that's one of the things we really emphasize. We're here to support you. What can we do? So we did a lot of things to welcome families. We got people out to, you know, greet mm -hmm. at a high school, people in the morning, mm -hmm. uh, greeting people at the counters and events. So we did that and just started getting information out on a regular basis, you know, uh, once a month. Every time we had a PTA mm -hmm. meeting, we would say, here's what, here's, uh, what we talked about. Mm -hmm. Here's the next meeting. We would mm -hmm. love to see you mm -hmm. there. So, so that was the first year. Second okay. year, I became president, and we moved from 200 to 400. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, we began working with the school, the school district, the superintendent, 
And they were impressed with the mm -hmm. parent engagement and community engagement that we had. Mm -hmm. And again, I had the post commander that, you know, worked with me and said, anything you need. So over time, over the course of three to five years, we were able to get 200 com com companies, and they call it the Meet Alliance now, to adopt the school and the school district. So our wow. kids were getting internships, That's apprenticeships. Great. We were given, we were getting like two, you know, one to two million dollars worth of scholarships for our senior class a year okay. from these companies, wow. and this was like a model school. It's one of the top. After about five years of doing that work, it was like one of the top school districts in the country. Oh wow! And that was the goal. I mean, okay. we went in because the uh, commander said, "Otha, uh, we want." Well, the principal said, mm -hmm. we want the best schools in mm -hmm. Maryland. And mm -hmm. the commander and I, you know, being military, we said, no, we want world-class schools. Right. And we actually built this system now. You can look at Anne Arundel County Schools. Okay. And it's one of the best school systems in the country. And I think with Georgia, that's one of the things that I could uh, – you can introduce things, but as state school superintendent, understanding the role, uh, you, you have an administrative role. But I think what I would bring to the table, too, is okay. an advoc advocacy type. Okay, okay. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> good to know. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you were, when it was announced that you were the newly elected first African-American male mm -hmm. national president of the PTA, where were you? How did you feel? Um, yeah. Well, being the first, and I've been the first on a couple other things, but being the first, you you have a uh, a heavy responsibility mm -hmm. because just like President Obama, I watched mm -hmm. him come into office and just like you, you carry the weight of the world and say, I got, I got to do this right. Mm. Because if not, then you think about the impact that it will have in well, the future. <laughs> I don't think the office is like that today, but okay. Yeah. That's that. That's how it should yeah. be. Um, so I want to say something, though. I think something important, though, is I actually was uh, sworn in in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. I did my, um, uh, not my ceremony, but my reception at the Underground Museum there. Mm -hmm. And I talked about... You mean Underground Railroad? Yeah, museum. Oh, wow. It's a, in Cincinnati, Ohio, okay. where I used to cross the, the river there right. to get into... And I talked to them about how our ancestors... The sacrifices they get to do their freedom and education is one of those things to help us it get is, there. It oh, is. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> education is. I'm going to get to education. Hold okay. on one no, second. No. Okay. Um, what was probably the most important accomplishment um, that you had as national president of the PTA? We got a lot accomplished, but I'll, I'll say a, a couple of things. Okay. Um, as a, every student succeeds that. Okay. Uh, I actually had the opportunity to sit down with the education committee, Senator Lamar Alexander mm -hmm. on that committee, Bobby Scott on the mm -hmm. House side, and talk through, hey, we mm -hmm. want to make sure that parents and other stakeholders have mm -hmm. input and say in the system. We, okay. We're owners in the system. Right. Uh, so we were able to get, you know, to get that language put in, and mm -hmm. I, you know, work with my staff to make sure they got mm -hmm. the language as they crafted the bill. So that went through. So I said mm -hmm. that's number one, and, and and we can. I saw the other month when they were uh, providing input mm -hmm. back to the federal government, mm -hmm. and I said, you know, we played a role mm -hmm. in making that happen. Mm -hmm. you, know, the, you know, national PTA in getting. Uh, language put in the bill for mm -hmm. stakeholders. Okay. So that was number one. So that was number one. Number two, uh, when I was president elect, I, as I travel around the country mm -hmm. into our units outside the country in our territories, people say, Well, what are you going to do for our kids? And I said, I'm for <laughs> all kids. I want to make sure. President that, Obama got that question right. Yeah. So, okay. so I started a program called um, Every Child in Focus which still uh, is there. They, they, they adopted it. Okay. But basically what I did, I said, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Every month I want to focus on a group of children mm -hmm. from particular groups. And what we will do, we will talk about the great things they're doing, mm -hmm. and then we'll talk about the challenges. Mm -hmm. And then I, I would like for the unit or state to focus on mm -hmm. how they want to address this over mm -hmm. the next year. So, so I'll give you an example. Um, January was month of the suburban child, so mm -hmm. all the units looked at that. Uh, 
February month of the African American mm -hmm. child. Mm -hmm. uh, March was the foster child. April was the military child. Oh, wow. May was Asian uh, Pacific Islander. Okay. June was a rural child. Okay. Um, uh, August was the international child because of children we have mm -hmm. of immigrants that are mm -hmm. you know in this country and some of the challenges. September the Hispanic child. Mm -hmm. Uh, October, the urban child, uh, November, the Native American child, and December, special needs. Wow. So we would That's do. Impressive. Yeah, so we would do town halls. Like, I give an example for special needs. I remember I went to Detroit mm -hmm. December, uh, I think, 2013, did a town hall. And the reason, as national president, when we would pick things, you would say, which state has the most mm -hmm. and the most experience. So I went to Detroit, which had 25% of their student body were special needs. Mm -hmm. uh, for the, for the uh, rural child, I went to New Mexico, where the majority of okay. rural kids are in that state. So that's what we sort of did, and okay. it really made a difference in people saying, yes, you're paying attention to our children, and plus every child fit in one or two of those categories. Okay, okay. <laughs> oh, seems like you did a lot as national president of the PTA. Now, I understand that you have aspirations for to seek um, office, the same office that I sought yes, back in 2014, <laughs> which is that of state school superintendent. Mm -hmm. um, was it your role as national president of the PTA that pretty much led you to want to seek this position, or is it something that you have um, had in your heart to do all along? No, uh, what what led me to it was uh, again I've had a life of service. You know, I mm -hmm. was active in scouting. And it was all about serving, mm -hmm. so that's what I did. Okay. And then once I again, as I mentioned, going to Morehouse, mm -hmm. I looked at the servant leaders like Martin Luther King, Maynard mm -hmm. Jackson, and mm -hmm. said, you know, that that's what I want to do. I want to be able to give back to uh, you know society. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, as I retired out of the military, you know, I retired pretty young, you know, 40, 43, 44 mm -hmm. years old. And it was like, you know, I got a whole nother right. 50 or 60 right. years. <laughs> okay, I hear you. So, so <laughs> I asked the question, how could I serve? Mm -hmm. How can I serve? So based upon, you know, uh, working in education for over a decade, because I served over a decade on the National mm -hmm. PT board in some ca capacity up to chair. Mm -hmm. And I said, um, what way could I best serve Georgia? Mm -hmm. and, and so when I started you know, looking at the positions and mm -hmm. thinking about it, I said, okay, this is where you're experiencing background, and you've helped shape national education policy. And even with Georgia, uh, I was legislative chair uh, in Georgia for Georgia PTA from 2010 through 11. Mm -hmm. So I got that opportunity to work now at the Capitol mm -hmm. and see how they dip, you know, mm -hmm. policy in Georgia. Every state, there's nuances and mm -hmm. differences. So I saw that as I thought about it. I said, you know what? I think I can make the most positive impact mm -hmm. for, our, for our children mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in that position. So that's how I came to that decision. Because I talked to people about, I mean, people, different people, and, and I said, this is what I'm thinking about. And it's like, yep, I think you do a great job for the state of Georgia. Okay. Now let's go back to um, where you lived throughout the state of Georgia. Sure. You, um, you're you from Elberton, mm -hmm. but you were only there briefly. Yep. You grew up mostly in Savannah. Augusta. Augusta. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you live in, close to Savannah now. Yes, I live you. right below Savannah. Um, you also, of course, lived in Atlanta where you were yeah. in school here. Mm -hmm. And you lived in Columbus. Mm -hmm. And Smyrna for two years. Okay. So, I got out of the military. <laughs> so do you think that living in all those different places throughout the state can help you get a better understanding of the different people in those areas and how to use that knowledge to help you understand what those superintendents would need in those different areas throughout the state? Oh, absolutely, okay. and, and 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 I'll tell you why. I've I've worked with superintendents since mm -hmm. I've been here, uh, in in rural, urban, and suburban communities. Mm -hmm. um, I was an assessor on Cobb mm -hmm. County Board of Parent Assessor mm -hmm. back in 2011-12 time frame. So I got to work with the board and mm -hmm. help evaluate their strategic plan okay. and objectives. Okay. Uh, in Elberton, I, okay. I know our superintendent very well there, uh, Mr. Uh, Chuck Bell, mm -hmm. and uh, I've 
you know, consulted with him and, and provided advice and, and resources and other superintendents mm -hmm. around the, mm -hmm. the state. So as you go to different areas, like rural areas, mm -hmm. when they have challenges with their population shrinking right. and, and jobs and economic development, okay. uh, you go to cities and, and you know, you have uh, particular problems and challenges there. So I'm able to look at that and look at their challenges because it's not a one size fit all. Mm -hmm. And you have to really take those things in consideration mm -hmm. and, and how can we best support mm -hmm. uh, you know these particular school districts based upon their needs. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now when you were um, national president of the PTA, I know that you were um, against the governor's plan to um, take over failing schools. Unfortunately, um, he got his wish. It is in place today. Sure. Um, explain that program, um, the acronym OSD. I, I would be happy. And to. also um, explain how, if you are elected state school superintendent, how will you work with the local superintendents to make sure that they're not overtaken by the state and can still operate independently? Great question. <clears throat> well, the Opportunity School District. Uh, the Opportunity School District uh, was uh, legislation. They wanted to do it, make it a constitutional amendment. And, and, and what a lot of people don't realize, once you get a constitutional amendment, it's almost impossible to reverse. Mm -hmm. So basically, what they wanted to do was the governor would have appointed a, uh, a superintendent, mm -hmm. and they would have, that superintendent would have determined what failing schools or priority schools they want to take over. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, and the legislation that was 13 pages, you would basically, once a school came into the system, mm -hmm. they would have to, uh, you know, pass or secede, you know, the standards mm -hmm. for three years straight. Mm -hmm. So if they passed it for two and failed on the third, then they would stay in the program three more years. So it was like they were being there for perpetuity. Right. Right. <laughs> right. And a lot of people, and this is where I have a great advantage mm -hmm. <clears throat> from working with the U.S. Congress and the ah, Georgia Assembly. Okay. Reading legislation and understand the impact that laws have on people. Mm -hmm. So with the um, OSD bill, it had language in there where it basically says everything in this bill overrides all law. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people didn't catch that. So I'm saying basically they can do anything they want to. They can bring this in private right. they can bring yes. in private companies. Mm -hmm. uh, they can discriminate because the law says they can do whatever to their discretion. The, the governor could appoint whoever he wanted. That is correct. For that Position? That is yeah. correct. So here, here's my take on that. And then, like you say again, House Bill 338, mm -hmm. they couldn't do it constitutionally, so they did it right. legislatively. Right. So how, how would I deal with that? Well, first of all, well, let me back up a little bit. I've seen this somewhere else <laughs> as national president. Oh wow! In okay. Michigan. Okay. Right. Um, uh, I That's actually a great example. Yeah, December mm -hmm. 2014. Okay. Uh, the Michigan PTA called me up uh, to Detroit to sit down with their school board. And, you know, at the time they were going through the bankruptcy mm -hmm, matter. Mm -hmm. The schools were, you know, uh, a lot of private charter school mm -hmm. systems there. And as I was sitting there talking about solutions to them, as I would mention to them, and uh, all of them would look at the emergency manager. Mm -hmm. And the emergency manager would say, well, you know, yeah, we can do that or not. And I'm like, wait a minute. We have duly elected school board members here, but they don't have the power that they were invested by the people. Mm -hmm. So that would have been the same thing with this OSD. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, instead of calling the emergency manager or superintendent, they call it the chief turnaround officer. <laughs> right, right. So exactly. I, I look at it from a constitutional mm -hmm. standpoint. Mm -hmm. You know, they talk about the Constitution a lot. Mm -hmm. But again, you have these constitutional positions, mm -hmm. and although the governor is at the top of mm -hmm. that, what you're doing is you're, you, you know what I'm saying, you're, you're crossing mm -hmm. into responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe whoever the governor is, the state school superintendent should work with the governor. I, exactly. But the, the people elected the school superintendent to meet the needs and requirements mm -hmm. of the school district mm -hmm. and the um, 
the education mm -hmm. support and you know, activities mm -hmm. in the state. Right. So uh, that's something that um, we would need to uh, talk about, who, you know, as far as getting an office and, and, and try to move. Why do we need a chief turnaround officer when you have laws and things in place that you can take care of that within the mm -hmm. superintendent's office? So you're going to pay someone a couple of hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. You know, you talk about less government, right. but right. You're, right. You're, 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 you're building the bureaucracy mm -hmm. there, and you have great people at the Department of Education mm -hmm. that can fix the schools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if you, if you want to be, and we want to be honest about it, um, when you look at problems, or you look at challenges we have in schools, it comes down to two things, mm -hmm. poverty and race. 60% of our kids in Georgia are on reduced and free mm -hmm. meals. Mm -hmm. So you got to handle the poverty problems and the racial issues that we have. Now, I will tell you this right here. Um, if 60% of our kids are in, in poverty, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that I worked with some groups with last year is mm -hmm. uh, Senate Bill 30, mm -hmm. and that was community schools. Mm -hmm. Within that bill, it dealt with wraparound services. Mm -hmm. If a kid's hungry, right. if a kid is physically ill mm -hmm. or can't do it, you can't teach them. Mm -hmm. you know? And like I said, you know, in my teaching experience, uh, I had to, as a professor, I had to uh, hire my students on where their mental state you know, are they eating water? You know, I mean, you, if you really care as a teacher, mm -hmm. you look at those things and say, you know, are there general needs being met? Are they taking care of themselves mm -hmm. so that you can teach them and get the outcomes that you, mm -hmm. you need to get? Yes, I, I completely agree with you. Okay, um, going back now, I guess, um, tying in federal legislation sure. with um, – state legislation or state policy, I should say, sure. in order to get federal funding, uh, race to the top, yeah. um, which I strongly dislike. Sure. I, I do understand accountability. Sure. What do you, what is your definition of teacher accountability? Well, I always tell teachers and parents, mm -hmm. education begins at home. Thank you. It does. But unfortunately, everyone's home's not equal, right. <laughs> you know, and then because of challenges, we have parents having to work two and three jobs mm -hmm. and, and just trying to survive, mm -hmm. you know, whether you have, may have another family, like say I was fortunate, although I didn't grow up with a silver spoon, mm -hmm. uh, with my kids, I was, you know, with my wife and I were able to mm -hmm. uh, create an environment where all I had to worry about is going to school mm -hmm. and right. doing their work. A lot of kids don't have right. that opportunity in Georgia. <laughs> So race to the top, um, I'm very familiar with it. Uh, I, you know, I think I mentioned to you, I, I did receive an endorsement from uh, Secretary Duncan yes, for, for my me. work. And, <laughs> and, and what, you, know, we, you know, we had those conversations okay. uh, about some things that we didn't necessarily agree with. Right. But I looked at the big picture and said, okay, we're going to get $400 million, okay, we have teachers that are going to lose jobs because we're not funding education in Georgia. Because mm -hmm. I was talking to uh, Secretary Duncan when this was going on. Okay. And so, and, and Georgia was pushing back. We had people mm -hmm. pushing back on it. And I'm saying, so, wait a minute, guys. We can work through some things here mm -hmm. with $400 million. Right. <laughs> okay. And as you saw in the Every Student Succeeds Act, mm -hmm. some of those things that teachers and administrators said, look, we 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 don't want to do that. AYP mm -hmm. went away, uh, mm -hmm. and if you were, and a lot of people they don't study history. If you go back to two thousand, you know, one when uh, President Bush was doing No Child Left Behind, mm -hmm. I said up front when I saw that it is not realistic for a hundred percent of kids to be reading on grade level in twenty fourteen. That's so true. But how he got us was he also promised that every school would be equal. 100 percent right. and that didn't happen that is um, as a matter of fact schools were, were penalized um and going back to testing mm -hmm. do you feel that testing is an adequate way to measure teacher success as well as student success no i am a if, if you were to to take my sat scores mm -hmm. i did average okay but that did not take away from hard work right. 
commitment, put in extra work mm -hmm. to go all the way from a poorhouse to the White House. You know what I'm saying? Right, right. So it, it, it goes back to work. It goes back to nurture. I had great teachers and, 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 a, and a great mom that encouraged us. Mm -hmm. And so all your environment and, and, and like I say, the, the school, the school is like really the center of most communities mm -hmm. because, you know, 90% of our kids go to mm -hmm. public schools. Mm -hmm. So that's why we really need to properly invest mm -hmm. and do the right things about that. Now, testing, testing is a requirement. I think over-testing, like, like Georgia, I mean, and again, I will have to, you know, double check this. I think we test like almost two or three times mm -hmm. as much mm -hmm. as other states. Mm -hmm. You, you, you shouldn't have to do that. You know, you have to do assessments. Right. You know, to make sure people are tracking right. and you get the outcomes. I got it. Right. But over testing and testing does not completely e e evaluate. And we can talk about HBCUs, mm -hmm. how they say that a, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, a better indicator mm -hmm. of minority students mm -hmm. is their grade point average, mm -hmm. not a SAT mm -hmm. or ACT. And I love our, our, our friend, uh, Dr. Calvin Mackey, mm -hmm. who is, man, this guy is like phenomenal, you know, doing STEM around the mm -hmm. country, mm -hmm. uh, works for the government doing nuclear inspections. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's funny he tells this story, and I'll make this very short. He talks about when he left New Orleans, he said he went up to the Georgia Tech table mm -hmm. and with uh, – uh, 800 SAT score, oh and then the guy, and the guy says, uh, he, he said, well, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be an engineer, and and he looks at his score, and he said, uh, it's not, uh, not going to do it. He said, well, I'll tell you what, I know a school that might could help you, so he pointed him up to Morehouse. Ah. So, so the guy, he moved, and he said, I want to be an engineer. He said, what's your SAT? He said, hey, you know, and um, he said that the guy looked at him and says, you're a diamond in the rough, but a diamond show enough. Wow. So with us, right. uh, with different groups, uh, you have to take those things into consideration. True. You know, I, I, and I'll just give you another example of testing. I went to the officer candidate school. Mm -hmm. Again, I didn't come from a well-to-do family, but I remember one of the, the questions that stood out to me was, how do you measure a horse? How many inner city kids would know how do you measure a horse? Mm -hmm. By hands. Uh, but I knew that. I so that's the cultural. I'm from Atlanta. Yeah, that's some of the cultural. <laughs> My mother probably would have. She's <laughs> from Fayetteville, which, by the way, is not yeah. the country anymore, but it used to be. Uh, okay. okay. But that's some of the cultural mm -hmm. biases mm -hmm. and tests. And if you're just not familiar with it, right. and the only reason I knew that is because I love to read as a child. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. I think it was a hand, you know, okay. and got that question right. Well, um, you bring up an interesting point about um, loving to read as a child. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I wanted to do when I was a um, candidate for state school superintendent mm -hmm. is to um, align with what President Obama was trying mm -hmm. to do as it relates to um, mandatory pre-K throughout the state mm -hmm. um, for all students, mm -hmm. possibly starting at the age of three. I know there are some um, gubernatorial candidates who want to start even earlier than sure. that, um, such as two. Yes, we do have a lottery, but in my opinion, I believe all students need to have access to pre-K mm -hmm. um, the same. Do you agree with that? Um, do you have anything, any plans in place to address that um, if you're elected state school superintendent? Um, absolutely. As a matter of fact, again, let's go back. Uh, like we'll go national, come to state level. Mm -hmm. I was pushing with President Obama mm -hmm. and uh, Secretary Duncan mm -hmm. on early investing in mm -hmm. early childhood. Okay. So uh, I'm still there. And, and again, there are 119. Well, our budget for 2018 mm -hmm. is 119 mm -hmm. million dollars short. Mm -hmm. So we can find the money. If we can find money to get Amazon, right. try to get Amazon, lower Amazon right. to Georgia, or, or, or help with the Mercedes-Benz right. Stadium, we can find money Absolutely. to fund pre-K. Yes. And it doesn't have to be lottery. It, just, it really comes down to political will mm -hmm. and advocacy mm -hmm. and also uh, finding companies with the resources mm -hmm. that are willing to invest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of where we look at that. Because uh, here's something I, I make an interesting point to folks. You know, Georgia has been ranked number one in business.
the last three or four years. Mm -hmm. Number one place to do business. Mm -hmm. But we're ranked 44th in child well-being. Mm. So that tells me wow. that we're really taking care of businesses by offering them all, you know, tax breaks, mm -hmm. tax incentives mm -hmm. to come here. Mm -hmm. But we're not investing in our mm -hmm. kids. And then when the states, when we continue to drop down from mm -hmm. 34, mm -hmm. I think we're 38 now, mm -hmm. right, nationally, mm -hmm. education systems. Uh, we should be moving up, and right. we can do that. Right. And again, about finding resources and political will right. and calling right. people out when you have to. Okay. I agree. <laughs> Okay, let's see. Um, why should I support you? By the way, I just want to give a disclaimer. Sure. Um, Rita Robinzine, the Rita Robinzine Show, um, Fanciful Films Entertainment Company is not endorsing a candidate. Of course, I'm going to vote when the time comes. Mm -hmm. um, why should I get behind you? Well, first of all, I see you look at people's track record. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm 50 years old. I have a life of public service. Mm -hmm. And um, I have the experience and the wherewithal to make things happen. Mm -hmm. This position is an it requires executive mm -hmm. skill sets. You know, I have over a decade of ex, you know executive skill sets working with national and not only the state of Georgia mm -hmm. but other states. Mm -hmm. So what I bring to the table is the will to to listen. Mm -hmm. Uh, to support mm -hmm. school districts and 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 uh, introduce them to resources mm -hmm. that are available. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I, I must I must I've been in my family has been in Georgia for over seven generations. Mm -hmm. So I've grown up in Georgia. So I'm homegrown. Mm -hmm. However, I've been mm -hmm. exposed to the world. Mm -hmm. So I can bring in ideas. Mm -hmm. Uh, and resources that really makes a difference. And, and that's why, and again, I think my heart uh, are for children. I mean, a lot of politicians say that, mm -hmm. but you can look at my work. Mm -hmm. uh, even as a, a military officer, mm -hmm. uh, I would go back to Elberton, mm -hmm. and I would go to you know schools in Savannah and Augusta and talk to kids and say, hey, education is important. Here are the things that you can do with a great education, and that's what you will get. And uh, being a retired colonel from the military, mm -hmm. one of the unfortunate things about politics uh, is the money piece. Uh, a lot of people, they, they go to the highest bidder, mm -hmm. and I tell people I'm not for sale. I'm here for That's content. what I said. <laughs> yep, yep, I'm here. Which is why I ran, by yep. the way. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to ask you kind of a hard question, sure. in my opinion. Okay. Um. When I was a candidate for um, state school superintendent, mm -hmm. all of us had experience in education except for mm -hmm. two, and they were actually the, the two who uh, made it to the runoff. Sure. And I guess my question to you would be, mm -hmm. how is it that since you have not gone through um, the public school setting in terms of as a public school teacher and administrator, um, how would you be able to relate to those who have or what will set you apart from um, a, an opponent who may mm -hmm. be able to say that, hey, I know what it's like to be a teacher. I was in, I have been in the classroom. I have been a principal. I know um, the stress that teachers deal with when it comes to testing sure. or whatever. How will you answer that question? Oh, that's a great question. And I, I, will, I will say a couple of things. Mm -hmm. Number one, a superintendent is different from a teacher. A superintendent requires that you have an executive skill set mm -hmm. that can take a vision that you've you know that you've collectively and collaborated with people mm -hmm. and advocate for the things for those teachers. Okay. Now, um, understanding uh, a school system again, I had children in school. Mm -hmm. My wife's an educator. Um, again, I share it with you mm -hmm. that I help create and build one of the top school mm -hmm. districts in the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So as a stakeholder, I had to uh, work with principals. Mm -hmm. I was appointed by superintendent mm -hmm. for um, in Anne Arundel County for creating high performing schools, mm -hmm. high schools. Mm -hmm. I was appointed by Governor Maryland mm -hmm. uh, for education committee. Mm -hmm. So I had to work with teachers. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I actually was a judge for teacher, National Teacher of the Year for two years. Mm -hmm. So, you know, interacting, working with mm -hmm. teachers. Okay. So I get it. And so, okay. like, like uh, I'll give you another perfect example. I'm mm -hmm. traveling around the state now. I've probably been to around 20, 25 mm -hmm. uh, counties. So when I talk to teachers, I listen. Good. And I, to educators. That's so important. And, and, and they say, so, 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 I say, so what are the challenges that you're having? Mm -hmm. So with executive skill set, with being able to listen, mm -hmm. I can say, a uh, teacher said, well, you know, we have a problem with mm -hmm. overcrowding classrooms. Yes, we, we got 30 to 40 <laughs> kids. So I hear that. 34, 30. Yes, right. <laughs> Thank you, yeah, Georgia yeah. legislature. Yeah. So, 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 I could, so, so, I could, so I could sit there and go, okay, so we're short $119 million, I mean, dollars in our, our budget mm -hmm. that they could, you know, that we need funding. Mm -hmm. And we have 30, so how do I need to advocate as an executive, mm -hmm. state education executive, mm -hmm. on getting that $119 million to get more teachers mm -hmm. in the classroom? Mm -hmm. How do I, as a state executive, mm -hmm. advocate with the state legislature mm -hmm. to deal with the teacher retirement mm -hmm. challenge that we're having? Mm -hmm. So that's executive. So right, right. in a classroom, like I mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. being in a class, I mean, I have education experience. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You have taught before. Yeah, yes. Comparable. Comparable. Yeah. Again, yeah. I had to teach learning objectives. Uh, what are the learning objectives and mm -hmm. what are the outcomes? Mm -hmm. How do I assess my students mm -hmm. to make sure that they're meeting the requirements to say they're a bona fide uh, graduate mm -hmm. to, to finish this school? Okay. And, I, and I'm, here's, a, here's a challenge. I love this analogy. Someone says, the legislators sometime think about Coca Cola. Okay. Coca Cola has a formula. It does. The teachers and educators in, in Georgia they have a formula. They know what works. So do they let do they legislate to Coca Cola <laughs> how they're going to build their formula Thank you. Uh, to make it make their product that's successful or do they go to the teachers. Right. So they never come to the teachers, absolutely. and that's the problem. Yeah. Um, I think there's a quote that says those who know nothing about education sure. are the ones who uh, make the decisions right. about education. Um, I was at a meeting not too long ago mm -hmm. where um, two top superintendents were present. Uh, my superintendent, Dr. Green okay. from DeKalb County, mm -hmm. Dr. Karstarfin um, out of Atlanta Public Schools. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, it was a relaxed setting. Hopefully I'm not going to get in trouble. Sure. Um, but anyway, <laughs> um, it was interesting because you got to hear their side sure. of, of the issues and what they deal with. And it's almost like, you know, how teachers sound when they're talking about um, certain things and certain problems and concerns um, that we sometimes have. And they were talking about how Georgia has all these lists and all of these requirements okay. that they need to um, follow and um, probably more than any other state. Are you familiar with these lists and are you going to do anything to reduce them yes. so that our superintendents will not be um, so stressed out trying to either stay off a list sure. or get on a list? Sure. Well, <laughs> well, again, remember we talked about the over-testing. Right. Again, uh, any way we could, <laughs> how can we, right. we reduce the right. testing? Okay. Um, th there are solutions to it mm -hmm. and, and we know it. Mm -hmm. The second thing is as I say with, with legislators, mm -hmm. have you spoken with the teachers? Mm, no. Have you spoken? And again, th th those those things that I'm doing now, Good. and I will continue to do, Good. because if I'm going to be an advocate, mm -hmm. then I need to say, hey, here's what my teachers are saying. And okay. I've worked with some of your teacher associations in Georgia, okay. uh, a couple of not all of them, and, okay. and 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 say, what's your take on this? Mm -hmm. What is going on with this? And, and just getting great input and feedback from them. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I will not mm -hmm. cease to do. But let me give you, I, I think that give you a better idea of Georgia. Here's the uh, elephant in the room with Georgia. Okay. Um, Brown versus Board of Education, right. 1954. Right. Okay. Uh, the Georgia Department of Education started in 1870. Mm -hmm. They started off with separate and Equal schools, which we know was not Set, right, separate, but <laughs> so a lot, yeah, a lot of people don't know, right. study the history. But Georgia in 1954 said we refuse to um, to honor Brown versus Board. Mm -hmm. And if you move to 1956, Governor Griffin at the time, mm -hmm. and this is in the history, you can check mm -hmm. it out. Mm -hmm. 
He said, we will privatize every school in Georgia before we integrate. I'm from Alberton. Mm -hmm. My schools began integration in 1967 mm -hmm. and then fully integrated until 1972. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so this was in some parts of Georgia. Mm -hmm. So at every turn, we've had the Georgia Assembly, mm -hmm. for the most part, trying to go around Brown versus board. So I'll give you a perfect example today. A lot of people don't know this. We have something called a student scholarship organization. Mm -hmm. All that is is a backdoor voucher mm -hmm. to send people to private schools. Mm -hmm. Last year, Georgia spent $60 million. On, so basically, if you want to send your kid to a private school, mm -hmm. I think this upcoming year, I could invest $9,450 mm -hmm. into your uh, student scholarship organization and write it off, right? as a tax credit. Right. So that's just, you're subsidizing private schools. Exactly. And, and, it, and that goes back to one of my core values. You can look at public schools as a public good mm -hmm. or private good. Mm -hmm. I look at public schools as a public good. And we, we have a lot of people that look mm -hmm. at Education, not to say a lot. They look at it as a private good, mm -hmm. and they want to uh, meet their needs and make money off of public schools, and that mm -hmm. should not be the case. Mm -hmm. And that is problematic. And that is the problem. And I guess that was going to be my next question: is what is the biggest problem you do see with public education? And I guess the, the privatization. Um, I have worked twenty nine years. This is the beginning of. You're 29 for me. I'm rare. I'm very rare. As a matter of fact, people are like, 29 years, that's unheard of. Sure. Um, and I know you said a lot about um, attracting teachers, but what do you have um, put in place for teacher retention? Well, I know Georgia has lost, I think, around a third of their teachers mm -hmm. first, for the first five years or the last couple of years. Well, first of all, it, it starts off with respect. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't. You don't put down teachers. And, and, and I will tell you, I think Georgia has some great schools. Mm -hmm. It's just the uh, narrative. And, and sometimes our legislators, you know, saying all these things mm -hmm. just to mm -hmm. get their legislation mm -hmm. through. Right. So, first of all, re respecting teachers is it, a respected profession. Mm -hmm. Everybody is touched by mm -hmm. a teacher, every profession. That's right. So, that's first. Mm hmm. The second thing in the retention is let's go back to retirement plan, which the assembly is going to have to give a couple hundred millions to show off the accounts. Why, why are we doing that? You know what I'm saying? Right. So teachers have to be comfortable that when you retire in a couple of years, that right. your retirement <laughs> right. is going to be in the bank. Right. Right. And you're not worried about taking right. cuts or your health benefits. Right. So that's how you retain teachers. Right. It's a, in educators, mm -hmm. it is a contract that the state made with you, mm -hmm. and and then once you make that commitment, we need to do it. So I think, you know, through respect, uh, through retirement, mm -hmm. ensuring that you protect them, and, 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 and offer other incentives for teachers. Okay. Um, not sure how much time I have, but I do want to ask you this. There are some school districts that like to hire uh, Teach for America mm -hmm. teachers. Mm-hmm. Okay, yep. um, and a lot of times, though, those same districts are critical mm -hmm. of teachers who have gone through the education program and have sure. degrees in education. Um, should the state hire more people who just come out of college without any type of educational training, or should we, or should the state spend time in? Um, well, of course, I'm talking about the public university system. Um, put more emphasis on educational programs to better train and equip teachers um, for the classroom. Um, I, I'm more inclined to the traditional teacher track. And, and what, I, what I mean by that is the average teacher, mm -hmm. they set in their mind that I want to be a teacher. Right. So they go through four years of training mm -hmm. and then continue training. Mm -hmm. So, and a lot of times they come from the community. Mm -hmm. So they understand the community mm -hmm. that they're in. Mm -hmm. With Teach for America, uh, again, teacher shortages, mm -hmm. uh, trying to fill a role mm -hmm. and, and, and establish themselves, mm -hmm. they come about. Mm -hmm. But again, I, I'm personally more inclined because they, they're here. 
-hmm. they're not they're not going away mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but the traditional teachers that have invested years mm -hmm. of training mm -hmm. and and have taken the time to you know what I'm saying that they love their profession mm -hmm. we want to make sure because sometimes um, and I won't take anything away from teach from mm -hmm. American teachers some of them that they just want to try right. or do something different right um, and that's career change you know mm -hmm. so uh, that's something we look at but mm -hmm. I'm, I'm more on, on the role of traditional teachers with the training okay um, let's see one more question um, you talked about working with um, former um, Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan mm -hmm. um, Betsy DeVos is well yeah and she's interesting oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, how would you work with her or because I would assume that at some point the every state superintendent will have to sure work with her in Absolutely. some fashion okay um, well, I'm a principal and progressive person. Okay. <laughs> so, so, so here's the deal. Okay. And I and I have no problems looking at her in the eye and saying, you know, uh, I support public schools a hundred percent. I'm you. not for vouchers. Good. I'm not for contracting everything out. Right. And that has not been her experience. Right. She's she went to private schools. Right. Her kids to private schools. Right. Pri everything. Everything. So that's what they understand. Right. So my my role would be to uh, protect mm -hmm. our public schools mm -hmm. and enhance them. Now let me share uh, some insight with you. Okay. When I was working with the U.S. Congress, mm -hmm. the Republican mm -hmm. the Republicans at the time they had not anticipated on a Republican president being elected. Mm -hmm. So when they did every student succeeds act, they built it to take away as much power from the federal education department as wow. possible so they put you know block grants put a lot of things mm -hmm. a lot of power back to the mm -hmm. states mm -hmm. and this is what happens so that gives the state school right. superintendents a lot more power right. than they had in the past so it's going to be interesting it is. Uh, there was a big uh, battle in AJC a couple of weeks ago mm -hmm. with the superintendent and the governor mm -hmm. where he didn't agree with what he sent up, mm -hmm. but the Secretary of Education will make the final decision mm -hmm. on whether they accept it mm -hmm. or reject it, mm -hmm. and she will probably go with her state school superintendent. Cool, that's good to know. Um, when I was a candidate for state school superintendent, mm -hmm. I, I wrote an article that came out January 1st in the AJC uh -huh. um, 2014, and I pretty much talked about some of the things that I wanted to do had sure. I got elected. Um, one of the problems that I see in education is that we try to get all of the students sure. to um, to matriculate through the educational system as if they're going to college. Mm -hmm. And because of that, a lot of students are not successful. Um, testing is a problem. Sure. Um, that's um, a frustration for them. Sure. And um, I'm not going to talk what I said I wanted to do to... Um, to address those students who the needs of those students who may not want to go to college. Sure. Um, do you have anything um, in place or any plan that you would like to see implemented if you become state school superintendent? Yes, and I can tell you about four or five years ago I started with uh, the career pathways. Mm -hmm. I believe that tw only 25 percent of Georgians have a bachelor's degree. So what's happening with the other 75%? Right, right. So, so my thing is we should educate a child who if they want to go to college, technical school, mm -hmm. uh, career, or military, mm -hmm. we just make sure they, they can read, write, and, and critically think mm -hmm. so they can make that decision. Mm -hmm. So I'm a, a big advocate. And, and again, the school system I was in, mm -hmm. in Maryland, uh, Anne Arundel School System, what we did, the kids basically between 8th and ninth grade took a career inventory. Mm -hmm. and they went to the career path and they got opportunities as they went through mm -hmm. and if they change their mind then they switch to another career path mm -hmm. but we have to uh, make education where kids are interested and yes. that we're, we're really meeting their interests right. and that's the way we do it so right. I'm, all, I'm all for technical education as a matter of fact I know Dr. Andrea da uh, da or Daniels now okay. we were classmates from Elton she's president of Athens Tech Oh wow! I, I spoke at their graduation okay. about two years okay. ago, and, and 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 just 
you know, great talking to her about some of the things we can do as we move forward. Okay, good. I don't know if I've gone over my hour or not, but I'm going to ask you a, a few more um, questions or two, one more, I should say. Um, looks like you, you like making history. You may end up being the first African-American state school superintendent. I don't think you've had one before. Um, win or lose, what's next for Otha Thornton? Well, I will continue. Okay. Uh, after I left the uh, National PTA president, mm -hmm. I continue to advocate for children, mm -hmm. and that's what I will do. I okay. will continue to advocate. I've been doing it all, all my life. Okay. And so I will continue to be an active advocate in the community to make sure our kids get a great education. Well, I wish you much success with your endeavors. And, again, I'm happy to have my Morehouse brother here, um, Dr. Otha Thornton to speak about his life, his career, and his ambition to become the next school, uh, state school superintendent of Georgia. Please go to Fanciful Films Co. on YouTube. Subscribe to my channel. Also go to my Instagram at Rita Robinzine, as well as my Twitter account. And this has been a Fanciful Films Entertainment Company production. Have a nice evening, Atlanta. Did I go over my way? <laughs> Four minutes. Oh.